Founded around 50 to 50, 52, 53, 50, 52 AD. The time of the penning of this letter was 60, 62 AD. He writes to them 10 years later. The question is, what prompted the apostle to write? And why did he write? Before we deal with the, these two questions, let me say that he was writing them at this time from a Roman, his first Roman imprisonment. So he's in prison and he writes these people. Why did he write them? What prompted this action? Ten years later. Well, I want to answer the question um, from two levels. Because if I answer it, um, either if I leave out both levels, then the answer would be incomplete. And I want to give you a complete answer. The first reason he wrote the letter is that the God who made everything wanted it written. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It was the will of God that the apostle Paul would write this letter to the saints at Philippi because God in his loving knowledge knew that we needed, in addition to the saints at Philippi, these things. And I'm glad that Paul didn't just send a messenger to verbally convey his thoughts, but he sent the things in writing so that we would have them, so that we could benefit. All scripture, we're talking about the Bible, you got to know when you're looking at your Bible that you're not looking at some ordinary book. This is not the work of, of Shakespeare or some clever author or some clever group of writers. This is the word of the Lord. The scriptures were given by the inspiration of God. That means that the Lord inhaled and <sighs> exhaled his word. The Holy Spirit moved upon writers, and they wrote that which God wanted written. Over a 1,500-year span, writers who had never, for the most part, met each other, God moved on these men at different places and time, living in various locations, to write books. The word Bible literally means little books. The Bible is a collection of little books that God watched over and made sure that these little books was put together into one book so that we would have God's love letter, that we would have God's road map from earth to glory. Isn't that wonderful? Second Peter chapter 1 says this about the word of the Lord. In verse 21, for the prophecy came not of old time, or the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, that is, as they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. So when people say, well, who wrote the Bible? Man wrote the Bible. Who wrote the Bible? You tell them God did. God used men. But the Bible is the only inspired, written 
Word of God. It is the most, most unique book in all existence. So, on one level, God moved on Paul. Okay? That's on uh, the uh, celestial level. Now let's go down to the terrestrial one. All right? On a human level, there were certain events that inspired Paul to write to these people at this time, at that time, from a Roman prison. The event was, and I'll give it to you succinctly, the generosity of the saints at Philippi. It was the results of their keeping their end of the two-sided relationship. It was the work of the pastor's aid committee, the pastor's aid department in the church at Philippi. It was that he wanted them to receive some careful instructions. That it was that a man named Ephroditus hand delivered the generous blessing from the saints at Philippi to the apostle Paul. Paul tells us this, he says in chapter 4 and verse 18, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. He describes it this way. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing unto God. While he was in prison, the saints at Philippi sent him yet again another offering. We've already studied how they blessed him and stood by him in the partnership. When he was at Philippi, when he was at Thessalonica, when he started the church uh, at uh, he started the church at Thessalonica, he started the church at Corinth uh, at various ventures. These people, this particular church, constantly communicated with him. An interesting thing happened when they sent this particular offering. And when I'm, I'm preaching now, real time. So we're not going back to Acts chapter 16. We're not going back 10 years. Uh, we're preaching real time at the time of the, of the writing, okay? He says this in um, chapter 1. Um, well, actually, if we look at chapter 2, I want something. The apostle writes to them about. Ephroditus, Ephroditus, and um, he also writes to them about Timothy, and in, in my reading this to you, and this again is Preach, Teach Sunday, even though it's communion, uh, I, I want to show you something here, and we're going to move as expeditiously as we possibly can, and if you love the scriptures, you'll love this sermon. If you, if you don't, you won't, I tell you, you just won't. But if you're saved, how are you going to be saved and not love the scriptures? Um, that's, that's, that's something in it. Paul was concerned about them, and he wanted to send Timothy to see about them. They were concerned about him, and they sent Ephroditus to see about them. Two sides. Two sides. A good marriage is a two-sided relationship. A good partnership, good business relationships, two-sided. Anything that works right. Unless you're in it, in it by yourself. It has to be give and take. You're not going to have your way all the time. If that's, if that's your impression of life, you'll soon learn differently. It doesn't work that way. It's two sides. Here at the church, upper room, it's a two-side relationship. For upper room to work, I've got to do certain things. And so do you. And if I do what I must do and you do what you must do, 
we'll make some things happen for the Lord. Amen. The CEO of your company must do what he must do, or she, in order for the company to, to survive. But then you must do what you must do. Or if, if, if you don't, the company goes out of business and somebody's unemployed. People have lost their jobs due to no fault of their own. They came to work on time. They worked hard. They worked diligently. They gave, they gave uh, 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 16 hours work for eight hours pay. They did everything they were supposed to and ended up laid off because the chief executive made a bonehead move. And then there have been chief executives who have done everything they were supposed to do, and yet there were people on the floor who, who made defective things. Chief executive gets fired, the business goes out of business, and the person on the floor gets lose their job also. It's two sides. Things have got to work right on both ends. Am I right? There is the teacher, then there's the student. There is the giving of advice, but you got to follow advice. Did you see the exchange? Paul here says to them in verse chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He says, I want to send Timothy because I'm concerned about you. And when Timothy brings word back to me that you guys are doing good, I'll be all right, even though he's the one in prison. But he loves them. Remember, he said to them that he, has, he loves them with the affections of Christ. And why Timothy? He says, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He says, I have no one in my quorum. Among my preachers, I have no one who is more like me than Timothy. And Timothy will care for you. Um, notice, now, Timothy didn't say that he was a more like-minded, uh, uh, his mind was more like Paul's than any of the others. Paul said that about Timothy. See, we're in a day now where a person would say that about themselves. But I, my mind is more like the pastors than anyone else. Well, that's not for you to say. That's for the leader to say. Amen. Think about it. So Timothy didn't say this about himself. Paul said this about him. He says, he will care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things that are Jesus Christ. So he says, I can't trust everybody with you. But you know the proof of him. That as a son with a father, he have served with me in the gospel. You know, Timothy, his credentials speak for themselves. For like a son with a father... Timothy has served with me. So I can send him, and I can trust him. I can trust that he'll take care of you, and I can trust the report that he brings me. Do you see that? Do you see his care for them? Do you see that? Um, now watch this. Verse 23, uh, him therefore I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it go with me. So I want to send him. I want to send him right away, but I need to check some other things first. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. I'm believing God to get me out of prison so I can come to see you myself. If I can't, if I can't come, I'm sending Timothy just as soon as I check that. But, but, but I want to see you because I'm concerned about you. You see the relationship now from Paul's end of it, Paul's care for them. Now, now watch how uh, it, it flips. He says, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaph Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, listen to this, and fellow soldier, but your messenger. Word that messenger literally means apostle. He says to the church at Philippi, he came to me from you. Now I got to, I want to send him back to you. He's my brother, my companion in labor, 
my fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. You sent him with a blessing for me to minister to my wants. But I want to send him back to you for he long after you all, he's ready to go back to uh, Philippi and was full of heaviness, listen to this, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. He got sick. When they sent him to deliver the blessing to Paul, while doing the work of the Lord, he got afflicted. It happens. Amen. It happens. So as you work for the Lord, and if something go wrong, or you find yourself in the hospital, or you find yourself sick, don't go, don't go, don't, don't sit there or lay there saying, Lord, I've done your will, and now you, Lord, you let me get afflicted. Lord, that ain't right. Well, Ephroditus got sick. While doing the work of the Lord. Do you see that? For indeed he was sick. He didn't have a cold. He was sick nigh unto death. You see that? But God had mercy on him. And not only, not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So when the Lord healed him, it wasn't just God healing him. The Lord blessed me also because I would have been hurt had Ephrodite died. You know yourself, when the Lord raises up people that you love, you, you're glad for them, but you're also glad for yourself. You take that, that kindness from the Lord personal, and you thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for raising up my mom. Lord, thank you for raising up my dad. God, thank you for raising up my co-worker. Thank you, Lord, that that thing didn't take that person out when it could have. Lord, I don't know what I would have done had they died. Paul said, I would have sorrow above sorrow. Isn't it amazing how we look into the real human feelings of this man? He was not a God. He was a human being. And when death struck, struck or when his loved ones got sick, it affected him also. He said, I sent him therefore, I sent him uh, therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be uh, the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such. No, receive him, and then don't just receive him, but hold him in high reputation. Why should we treat him special? What puts him on a pedestal? I'll tell you what. Because for the work of Christ, he was not unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. He says in verse 30, for the work of Christ. What work? The work of winning souls? No. What work of Christ? The work of casting out devils? No. What work of Christ was the work that this man did that Paul said you should hold in high reputation? He brought Paul an offering. Paul calls that the work of Christ. Isn't that amazing? When people see you bless your man of God, people say, oh, those people up there, they're crazy. Or they say, oh, so and so can take all their money. And even, even there are people amongst you who say, I don't think you should do that. Well, let me tell you something. That's the work of Christ. Just as winning souls is the work of Christ. Just as casting out devils is the work of Christ. Just as going down to the abortion clinic and fighting for the lives of the unborn is the work of Christ. This too is the work of Christ. And the man almost died being a blessing to the mighty apostle. And, uh, and God raised him up. It was this act of generosity. This great act of kindness. This great act of courage that on a human level prompted the apostle while in a Roman prison to begin to write to the saints at Philippi. When I meet Aphrodite, when I get to heaven, I want to shake his hand. I want to hug him because I'm going to tell him, man, had it not been for you, perhaps we wouldn't have had the book of Philippians. Thank you. Thank you for risking your life to bring an offering of all things to the preacher. Thank you for that kind of courage. 
Oh, you don't know how to say amen to that, do you? But it's Bible. Now you can search from now till Jesus come and you won't find a scripture to contradict it. It was and it is the work of Christ. He wrote or he writes to them to give them proper perspective in addition to what Aphrodite did. He wanted them to have proper, a proper or the proper perspective on his imprisonment and on his challenges. Because when people see you suffer, if, you know, they can assume different things. We live in a day of assumptions. People make assumptions and just assume that the assumptions are true just because that's what they assume. Paul said, I want you to know how, I want you to view how I see my imprisonment. I want you to know how I see my perspective on the tough things that have happened to me. He said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, he says, But I would you, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. He says, the things that happened to me have promoted the kingdom. It has advanced the kingdom. I'm not in prison saying, God, you did me wrong. I'm not thinking that the, the, the beatings that I've taken and the pains that I've suffered. I'm not saying, God, you mistreated me. He's saying the things that have happened to me have promoted the gospel. He says, as a matter of fact, look at this. So that in my bonds in Christ, that is in my imprisonment for Christ, are manifested in all the palace and in all and in all other places. He says, even in the palace, the palace gods are getting saved. The palace guards, the people who are, who are, who are uh, paid to watch me, these Roman prison, prison guards are getting saved in prison because I'm here. He says, and the word is getting out everywhere about this revival that's going on in prison. So I want you to know, he says, I want you to know my perspective. My perspective is not that God has done me wrong and, and woe is me, but the things that the Lord have allowed to happen to, uh, to me are for the promotion and the furtherance of the gospel. Wouldn't it be something if we had his perspective? He says, and many of the brethren in the Lord wax, waxing confident in my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He says, and there are preachers now who have begun to preach with power and authority when they've heard about what happened to me. Woo! My afflictions have fired up others. The things that I have suffered have made others more bold. Brother Wilson told me today before we came out, not knowing that I would preach this, Says, Pastor, I was in Greenville at my loved one's home going service and said, You should hear what the preachers are saying about the ministry up here in Raleigh. Many preachers now are, 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 are saying that this, this, this man is a gospel preacher. He stands for the Lord, and the ministry has encouraged others to come out of the closet and say what needs to be said in Jesus' name. So I say, for the stripes that I've taken and the licks and all of the painful things, if it has inspired someone else, then it's good that these things have happened to me. Oh, that we live our lives in such a manner to inspire somebody to be stronger for the Lord. Can I get a witness? Paul said, and many, look at this. He said this about uh, uh, some groups, verse 15. He says, some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. He said, now some of them who are preaching, they don't even have pure motives. Hmm. They're preaching for envy and strife. And in others, look at this, he says, others uh, are also of goodwill. He says, one preach Christ, of contention, not sincerely, 
supposing to add to my affliction. Some of them are, are preaching Jesus the more to try to throw off on me. This is an incredible man. He says uh, to, to add to his affliction, but, uh, verse 17, but others of love, knowing that I am set forth uh, for the defense of the gospel. Some are preaching, throwing off on him. Others are preaching because they love the Lord. They understand what's going on with Paul. So, uh, so Paul, what do you think? What do you think about these preachers? Some are preaching to try to make your way hard. Others are preaching uh, because they're sincere. What are your thoughts? Paul says in verse 18, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. What a man. He says, even if they preach Christ for the wrong motive, if they're preaching Christ, somebody can get saved. A drunk can preach Christ, and somebody gets saved. Charlatans have preached Christ, and somebody still got saved because the man wasn't right, but the message is right. Now, you want to be holy. That's not my point. So I don't want anybody to leave because, you know, yeah, one of the reasons my sermons take so long, I have to explain everything. You have to explain everything now. You say, you say the, you have to explain the T, the H, and the E. I'm not saying that you don't have to live holy to preach. But Paul just said even those who preach for bad motives are still preaching Christ. And Christ uses them because there's something about the gospel. Praise the Lord. That if a joker said right, there's still power in the old rugged cross. And if there is power with the gospel being preached from the mouth of a joker, what do you think happens when the gospel is preached from somebody who's saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost? Paul understood that the most important thing was not his welfare, nor whether he was free nor locked up. The most important thing in his life was that the gospel was preached. So he writes to them and, and gives them uh, his take on preaching the gospel. He even, he even declares, praise the Lord, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm about to get happy here. Let, let me move on. He, 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 he encourages them that they need to work out their own salvation. He says to them in chapter 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but more so, but now much more in my absence. Because I can't be there right now. I'm locked up. He says, not, not work on, but work out. Experience this message in its entirety by calling toll-free 877 463 3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.